This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Thank you very much. Is this working? You know, I've been shot at a uh, hundred times. I've been kidnapped. I've been beaten up by mobs. I've been detained. I got arrested by the Taliban. You can't hear me. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been shot at. I've been beaten up. I've been detained. I've been kidnapped. I've been arrested uh, by the Taliban. Nothing uh, is so terrifying to me than to stand before a crowd of uh, people who are going to actually <laughs> actually hold me accountable for what I say. So um, kind of bear with me as I stumble my way through this. Um, you know, I, uh, these wars, both of these wars, they began so long ago that um, they're kind of hard to remember how they began. I mean, I mean, you know, I was a kid, everybody was, uh, I mean, when you go out there now, when you go to Afghanistan, you meet guys who were, you know, they were in fourth grade when, when the planes hit the towers. You know, they don't even remember. Um, and, uh, you know, one of them thankfully is over, at least over for us. Um, and the, the other one is still going, the other one you know, being Afghanistan, of course. And we'll, we'll, we all hope uh, and uh, at the end of next year and for the United States, we all, we all want to go home. We're all kind of exhausted by them. Um, and I, I thought what I would do, you know, you, you can turn on the TV or you can, uh, you know, pick up a newspaper or whatever, and you can kind of hear people talk about these wars in, in usually a, a pretty abstract way. Um, you know, it was right, it was wrong, this is what you should believe, this is what happened over there. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, when I was in Iraq and in Afghanistan, I used to hear, I, I, I couldn't listen to that stuff when I came home. Um, for that reason, it was so removed um, from my experience there. And what would happen when I came home is people, they wouldn't ask me how I, you know, what do you think about the war in Iraq? Was it right or wrong or whatever? Um, they would say, God, what's it like over there? You know, um, tell me a story. Um, and so I'd tell him a story, you know, I'd say, God, you know, I was driving my car and then, you know, we hit this checkpoint and the guys had masks and, and I'd, I'd tell him a story. And so um, when, I, when I wrote my book about the wars and, and what I'm going to try to do a little bit tonight is um, I just want to kind of convey to you what, what it feels like to be there. Um, you know, war is such a strange thing. Uh, you know, the cliche is it's like seven parts boredom and, and one part terror, and, and, and that's right. Um, you remember the terror. Um, but but war, war is so amazing because it kind of, it's like the human condition kind of in, in extremis. You get everything. You see people at their absolute worst. Um, you see people at their best. Um, when I was in Iraq, in Afghanistan, um, it's an amazing thing. Um, I mean, you can feel the kind of historical plates sort of shifting underneath your feet. Um, you can see kind of history unfolding right in front of you. It's an amazing thing to see. And I, so I, what, what I want to try to do, I've got some really amazing photos. When, 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 I, when, when I came out of Afghanistan and Iraq, I, I kind of called all my photographer friends that I'd worked with and 
I asked them to kind of send me their best photos so I could sort of try to tell the story. And, that, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. I want to just take you through basically my experience. Um, I, every photo you see, I think just about, I was present for, I kind of saw it so I can kind of talk about it. But, you know, I just kind of started covering these wars by accident. I, I, uh, um, well, this is Afghanistan, but I, I, you know, I was working for the Los Angeles Times. It was 1997. Uh, you know, I was working in Orange County, uh, you know, God help me. Uh, and, and, uh, and they kind of, you know, they had an opening in the deli bureau and they said, you know, uh, who wants to go? And at the time, like, you know, everybody, they went down this enormous list of people and asked them if they wanted to go. And everybody kept saying no and no and no and no. And I was like the last guy standing. And so, um, you know, I didn't have a nice house with a pool. And, and so uh, I ended up in New Delhi and then there was this kind of strange place called Afghanistan and this was in the 90s. And so it was, you know, three years before 9-11. It was kind of the time when no one was thinking about these places. I wasn't thinking about them. And so I just started kind of showing up in these places and looking around and it was a weird time, you know, and you could tell that not all was right. And, and, um, and it was kind of unnerving, and I used to call my editors in L.A., and I'd say, I'd come out of Afghanistan or Pakistan next door, and I'd say, man, it's really weird here, you know? I don't know what's going to happen. And, 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 of course, it was a daily newspaper, so they'd say, you know, can you write 600 words on that and, and put it in the paper tomorrow by 8 o'clock? And, and, um, but I, I always had this kind of angst about it. And then, anyway, so... Um, a couple of years later, you know, it was uh, September 11th, and I was in New York, and, and you know, the, when the planes hit the towers, and of course, everything that I had seen, though, for those last few years, suddenly it kind of all, you know, everything clicked. Um, it made perfect sense, and so I went back um, in 2001 uh, for the Afghan war, for the beginning of the Afghan war. I mean, it was so long ago, my God. Um, and then I stayed for a couple of years, and then basically, like the rest of the U.S. government and U.S. Army, I, I went to Iraq when that war started. I stayed there for too long. I stayed too long at that party, but, but, but four years I stayed in Iraq, and then, uh, and then I started going, then I, I came back to the United States to write my book, and then I started going back to Afghanistan, and I was, I was in Afghanistan as recently as just last year, um, and so I want to just try to kind of walk you through kind of some of the stuff that I saw, and I'm going to just kind of go through some of these photos and, and, and kind of pause them here and there. So let's make sure this, this thing works. Um, this is, can you all see that pretty well? Um, you know, this is Afghanistan. I've just got kind of a reel of photos here that are from the period when the Taliban, I, I started going there when the Taliban were actually in charge and they were the government there. And, you know, Afghanistan is such an extraordinary place. Like a photo like this, I mean, it's like the land that time forgot, you know? Um, and this is really what it looks like. You know, you just, you drive down the road and you feel like, um, you know, this photo could have been taken 150 years ago, you know, if they had cameras then. Um, and it was such a weird time. Um, I wanna just, uh, can, you, can you show me the map of Afghanistan really quick? They're gonna flip back here. I've got this pointer. So if you just, um, this is kind of important, I mean, well, maybe you can remember this, but, but at the time, when, when the Taliban were, had taken over Afghanistan, they had taken over everything but a little corner kind of right up here. And that's where these kind of rebels were holding out. So I used to go to Kabul whenever I could get a visa from the Taliban, which was bizarre. I would sort of go in here, but then I, you could, if you flew to Tajikistan, I mean, it would take like a week. Um, and that thought, seriously, I mean, it was like, and you'd stay in these ghastly hotels and, and, and kind of drive down and then cross a board, cross the river, the Oxus River on a barge. And you could, you could hang out with the rebels. And they were the guys that were kind of holding out against the Taliban. And anyway, you can go back to the photos. So, because that, that same little pocket is where uh, when 9-11 happened, that's where the U.S. went, basically. It's where the CIA guys went and the Special Forces guys, and it was kind of, and so I just went back to where I was. So I, I just, I just want to show you some of these photos from the time. I mean, this is, this is, cla this is a donkey parking lot, actually. Um, and, you know, the guy looks like Father Time. Um, and, and I, you know, this is like 1999 or something in, in, in Talacan, but I just want to give you a sense. This is, uh, you know, this is what a village in Afghanistan looks like. Um, 
you know, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's kind of nothing. And, and so we would wander around in that period. And I remember, again, uh, you can never predict the future in these places, but um, you could sort of tell that, that something was wrong. This is, you know, the, the landscape looms so large everywhere in Afghanistan. This is in the north. Uh, it was after an earthquake, as you can see, the, the, whole, the whole earth broke away. And this was just a line of women who were kind of walking, you know, walking to nowhere. Um, so I'm just going to flash the couple, couple, couple of scenes here. There's a really, uh, there's a nice photo I want to come. This, this is nice. This is, um, this is a camera, uh, like an old camera, and that old man there is the young man in the in the in the photo here. And of course, at the time, the Taliban, you know, they didn't allow you to uh, take photos. There were there were no no displays of human images were allowed. So this was like done in an alleyway or something. Um, but um, it's such an amazing place, uh, Afghanistan, for the reasons that you can see here. It's kind of desolate. Uh, the faces of the, of, of the Afghans are just amazing. Um, this, I, I just want to stop here for a second. Um, this, is, this is downtown Kabul, uh, as I found it in 1998. And that street right there, it's called Jaidi Maiwand. Um, it's the main shopping street in Kabul. And I, and I think if, if you have to remember one photo tonight um, and, and when you try to figure out what it is that happened in Afghanistan, just remember this photo. Um, basically, you know, it all started in 1979. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, killed, I think, a, you know, a million people, um, basically destroyed the country, and then they left. They left in 1989. They departed. And then, of course, a couple years later, the Soviet Union itself just imploded. And this is kind of what they left uh, behind. And, and then, basically, for the next 12 years, until 9-11, uh, Afghanistan basically just kind of imploded. And a, a civil war broke out. The government collapsed. All order collapsed. Total chaos. Um, and again, this was downtown Kabul. The Taliban were nothing but a bunch of, you know, country boys, basically, uh, you know, really primitive guys. But but they brought order to the country. They brought the civil war to an end. And and that's kind of so. When you went to Kabul in 1998, as I did here, and you talked to Afghans about the Taliban, they didn't like the Taliban, but they but they said, you know, they brought they brought the fighting to an end, you know? Um, they were the meanest, toughest guys there were, and they stopped it. Uh, and so in the beginning, they were kind of grateful, you know? Um, but that's basically what happened. I mean, kind of, you know, out of this uh, came Al-Qaeda, you know, and, and then 9-11, and then, and, then and then the war that we're kind of stuck with today. So um, let me just give you a couple, there's just a couple of shots here before I get to 9-11. I get to um, I'm just trying to, you know, I, I, I told you in the beginning that um, I had been arrested by the Taliban, and I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story as I flip through. This is a father and son glass blowing uh, business. Um, I, I was, um, it was a year before 9-11, and I was in Kabul, and I was doing some things that I wasn't supposed to do, wasn't supposed to be doing, I think, and the Taliban was in charge, and I, I got arrested. and. My interpreter, an Afghan guy, they beat him savagely, um, and they arrested me, and they, they, they kicked me out of the country, basically. And I, I just remember um, driving to the border with uh, this young Taliban guy, and I was so angry about my interpreter, and I was yelling at him the whole time. And then he started yelling at me, and he, you know, he's talking about the, how great the Taliban were, and I'm an infidel Westerner and all this stuff. And then, you know, every 20 minutes, he would kind of calm down and he'd say, do, do you think you could get me a visa to the United States, by the way? <laughs> um, you know, um, that happens like everywhere, you know? They just, it flips all the time. I hate your country, but God, you know, if you can get me a visa. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember, um, I can't even remember his name, you know? And, and so it was like a 15-hour drive to the border and he took me to the border and, and I, was just, I was just angry the whole time about Farid, my translator. And so he said, okay, it was at the Khyber Pass, and he said, okay, you know, get out of here. And, and I remember thinking, man, these guys are gonna be in power for a long time, you know? They're so sure of themselves, you can see it in their eyes. And, um, 
And I remember, because I was so angry, I said to him, you know, I'm going to come back here one day and you're going to be hanging from a light post, you know? And, and, um, and he sort of looked at me with, you know, slack jaw. And um, little did I know that I'd be back, you know, I'd be back a year later. Um, and I think he was hanging from a lamppost. Um, um, so this is like four, four sisters in Kabul. Um, um, I, I want to say this is American Gothic. It's sort of the Afghan version of it. Um, you know, it's like mom and mom and pop with preemie baby. Um, um, and this is this is this is. I, I'll just show you this. This is Talakan. Uh, this is a, this is a this is a, a little town in northern Afghanistan. And I spent a lot of time there in the late '90s. And then I went back there uh, the day that it was. I'll come to this later. But the day that the Taliban fell. And this street here was just remarkable. People were out into the streets. The guys were taking the turbans off, and they were digging up these television sets out of the ground that they had stored the whole time. And, and it was just an amazing scene, you know? Um, but at the time, anyway, um, this, is, I, I, this is kind of an aside, but um, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you people recognize him. He's, his name is Ahmed Shah Massoud, and he, I, I showed you, can you show the map one, really quickly um, of Afghanistan? Um, this up here, he, he was the guy controlling this little piece of territory. And he was the last holdout. You can go back. He was the last holdout against the Taliban. You know, these warlords are just, you know, some of them are mean dudes, you know? I mean, they, they practically eat, you know, children for breakfast. And he, he looks like, a, you know, an Italian painter. And, um, and he, and, you know, he was fluent in French. And he was, uh, he was really a remarkable guy um, and humane and... Uh, fun to talk to and kind of hang out with. He loved reporters. And um, I, I don't know how you remember this. It's very interesting. He was kind of pro-Western. And so on September 9th, two days before 9-11, um, Al-Qaeda killed him. Um, and, and then 9-11 happened. And so they, they knew that uh, the Americans were going to come to him. Um, and they were right. Um, so they thought, well, we'll take care of him first. And then we'll do the 9-11 attack. Um, anyway, he's a great guy. Um, and this is just a, I spent a couple of days with him. And I, you know, this is this crappy helicopter they had. And the engine blew up. And we got stuck there for a few days. Uh, and this sort of thing happened all the time. Um, and I just want to, this is a nice, nice shot. Um, all, the, all the men in the, came down, you know, from the villages. They heard the great Masood was in town. And they were all kind of limping on their plastic legs. Um, just I, a couple more shots here of just some. I, I like I like this picture because you know um, these kids can't read their own language, you know, much less English. And uh, you know there was like there were poppy there were poppy growing everywhere um, at the time. But um, I just got a couple more of these I want to show you before. I mean, this, you can see the landscape is so stunning. Um, Again, just kind of a typical scene in, in Afghanistan. So whenever, whenever, whenever you hear somebody on television say, we need to bring more development aid to Afghanistan, just remember, look, this is what they're working with, you know? Um, it's hard. Um, this is a girl's school. Um, and, you know, I should just say, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, people, everybody wants to go home, right? Everybody wants to leave, um, of course. And we've been there for too long. We've spent too much money. Too many people have died. Um, but when people say we haven't accomplished anything, um, just remember, just remember the girls. You know, when I was going to Afghanistan in 2000, um, in 1999, there were no girls in school, like zero. You know, it was prohibited. And now there's three and a half million girls in school. And, you know, if one thing has changed that country more than anything, it's that. Um, you know, we've built a lot of schools. I think there were one million boys in school. Now there's like five million boys in school. Um, but, but the, just remember the women. Um, this is, and I, again, I, don't wanna, I can't talk this long about every photo, but, but um, this, is a, this is a nice shot because, I mean, I love the look on her face. But when, when you go to Afghanistan, you know, it's, it's, on, the, it's on the old Silk Road. And so, um, you know, every, every chromosome that, like, God ever created is, like, passed through there. And so you get, like, you know, green eyes, blue eyes, Blonde hair, red hair. I mean, man, you get everything, you know, Asiatic, everything. Um, and so um, you can see the terribly, terribly troubled look on her face. But, um, and I think, so uh, just let's go back to the map really quickly, if we could. 
<laughs> that wasn't a joke. Um, so, um, so anyway, so let's just, you know, imagine 9-11 happens and, um, you know, this is the way it works at the New York Times. Like some editor came over to me and said, Didn't, weren't, hadn't you been to Afghanistan before? And I kind of jumped up and said, yeah. Sorry. And, um, and, and he said, well, just, you know, find your way to the rebels, you know, um, and, and, and call us when you get there. And, and, you know, it was like a Monday, and he was like, you know, we, we're going to be expecting to hear from you, you know, by Wednesday, and we'll have a story in the paper or something. You know, and it took, again, it took like, it took like two weeks, but, but I, I think I flew to Kazakhstan, you know, and then, uh, and then I flew to, and then I, I flew to this lovely town, uh, Dushanbe, which is a total dump. We used to call it the Paris of Central Asia, just jokingly, but I kind of made my way down here bribing people the entire way. And, and then I, I crossed the river again and sort of in the same place where I had gone a couple years before. And, and this is kind of was the area where, where kind of the Americans ran the initial war out of cobbles down here. There was a front here and there was kind of a front line up here, you know, the rest of its mountains. You can go back to the um, and then, so, so basically, we're, we're kind of in, in 2001 here. This looks like Jean-Claude Van Damme has taken over the command of the, but, you know, and, and the funny thing about this photo is that, you know, the, the, the Northern Alliance, which was the name of the rebels at the time, it's now the government, but, um, I mean, these guys were, you know, illiterate, uh, no uniforms, you know, just, it was like pick up basketball with guns. And, and, uh, and then the Americans sort of showed up and said, here, put, put on these uniforms. And, and they gave everybody a haircut. And uh, so suddenly they looked official, you know. Um, and so here they are. And kind of it's right, right as the war is, is kind of getting underway. And, and I think the next shot, um, this is the first day of the war. I think it was October 12, 2001. And this is uh, a line of B-52 strikes. Uh, those are 2,000-pound bombs. And I just, want to, I just want to tell you what it's like. Um, it's, you know, it's not like the movies uh, where the bomb goes off and then you can hear dialogue. Um, you know, it's, um, I was with my friend named, named James Hill and he's a photographer who took this photo. And James and I had rented this mud hut in this town called Hojabawadeen and we rented a generator. We rented a bunch of people basically. And we were staying in this mud hut and it was the nicest mud hut in town because it had windows, it had glass windows, and which is, which is important. And so we were, the front line was about 10 miles away, right up here. And um, we woke up one morning, it was about five o'clock in the morning, October 12th, and it was like an earthquake when the, when the China cabinet or the tea service is shaking, it would just shook. And you, that was the bombing. It was like an earthquake. Um, and that's what it's like. I mean, that's what these airstrikes are like. They are, like a 2,000 bomb does not just go off and go away. You know, it shakes the earth for a long time. Um, and in and, and, and those initial days, you remember, we had almost no troops on the ground and sort of the Americans just bombed for six weeks, basically, until they ran out of targets. And then finally the Taliban sort of gave up. Um, this is a funny little sequence. It's not funny, but uh, th this is the Northern Alliance again. This is the government now. And, and we were outside of a city called Kunduz, which is in northern Afghanistan, and the Taliban were trapped. They were under siege. And we were all standing around, uh, which is what you do most of the time in these places. And somebody ran up and said, uh, the Taliban have surrendered. You know, the Taliban have surrendered. Um, so we all got together and we marched into this town. And you can see this is just the guys marching in. And then it turned out that the Taliban hadn't surrendered. It was actually a trap, and they started firing rockets. And so this brilliant army that was marching so deliberately in, um, you know, just went to pieces and kind of disintegrated. And that's kind of what it was like there, and it still is, you know. Um, you think it's a real war and with kind of uniformed armies and all that, and it's really not. You know, it's just kids with guns running around, and, and and that's basically what happened. I, well, we barely made it out of this. I think this is the only frame that James was able to shoot, you know? A um, bunch of people got killed. Um, so I think I'm just about, so basically my, my kind of journey was, you know, I, I went to the war in 2001 when it started. I went back in 2002 and then, you know, the Iraq war started in 2003. And so if you remember, um, 
basically at the time in 2002, we all thought the war in Afghanistan was over, Taliban were finished, and they were, the Taliban were gone. I mean, they were nowhere. And then everybody started talking about Iraq, the administration, et cetera. But most important really was all the resources, uh, the troops, uh, everything, all the money, all the attention, all the planning, it went to Iraq. Um, and we forgot about Afghanistan for, you know, for five years, basically, and took our eye off the ball. And, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that, but um, that's basically what happened. You know, we, we kind of took the whole friggin' thing and moved it to Iraq to do that war. And meanwhile, th this one got away from us, you know. Um, so, like everybody else, uh, I went to Iraq in 2003, so I want to... Oh, I'm not quite done, sorry. Um, this is an extraordinary set of photos. I, I, James and I were just driving through the desert one day. This is kind of late 2001. The Taliban are collapsing. Um, and it happened. My God, the Taliban, the whole government collapsed in about three days. We couldn't even keep up with them, you know? Uh, they were surrendering so fast. And so we were driving across northern Afghanistan. Give, give me the map really fast, please, if you could. Um, sorry. Um, we were just driving over here, uh, and, and it's like flat as a tabletop in northern Afghanistan. It's the steppe, and really, you could roll a bowling ball for like a mile and a half and not hit anything. Um, so you can go back to the photo. So we're just driving along. We didn't really know where we were, and uh, we suddenly came across a line of trucks filled with Taliban prisoners. And I was like asleep because I hadn't slept for like a month, and I heard James just kind of screaming in the way that an excited photographer does. Pull over, pull over, you know, um, oh my God. And I kind of got out and this is what we saw. I mean, it's just extraordinary. There were a thousand Taliban prisoners packed into these trucks. And, and what I remember from the time, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, apart from the smell that was coming off the trucks, um, was they were calling out for water and they were calling out for water in about eight different languages, you know, uh, Urdu. Um, I got Russian, Arabic, uh, Pashto, Dari, Farsi, just, just one after the other. Because um, they'd come from all over. And, and you can see, if you kind of looked closely at some of these guys, um, they just, they'd come from all over the world. Um, and those were the guys that were fighting with the Taliban. So the interesting thing, I think I've got, we just hung around with these guys for a bit. The interesting thing, I mean, look at, Look at him, for instance. Um, he's from like North Africa, you know. Um, and and the, these trucks, these trucks had stopped in the desert because uh, in the or on the middle of the steppe because the Northern Alliance, uh, you know, the Taliban had been fighting each other for 25 years at that point. They had no experience taking prisoners. They didn't take prisoners, you know. They just killed them. So they, suddenly, you know, the Americans are around. They had to be on their best behavior. They didn't really know what to do. And so they were literally standing there in the middle of nowhere, and they were kind of arguing with each other, what the hell do we do with these thousand guys? And so James and I left, and we just took off. And um, they killed them. Um, they, they took them about 50 miles or 100 miles down the road to the west. They dug a big pit, uh, and they buried them all alive. Um, and that's kind of, you know, um, that's kind of the way it is over there. Uh, you know, they play for keeps. Um, and, you know, there's still, you can drive to, it's called Dashti Lali, where they, where they killed them. You can drive there now and you can see the old, the old trucks and the freight cars and the, you know, you can pick through the old shoes. Um, anyway, this is, this is another, uh, you, you can see that this was a big battle that I had seen uh, at a place in northern Afghanistan called Kala Jangi. It was a prison. It's where, it's where John Walker Lynn, the American Taliban, was found. Um, I didn't get to see him, but um, you can't really see here, but uh, these are basically just dead Taliban, and these are the Northern Alliance guys, and they're, they're basically just looking for stuff. They're taking rings off of fingers and prying shoes off, and um, anyway, strange time. Um, this is my last frame, I think, from Afghanistan. Uh, th this is a guy, he was, in, he was from Saudi Arabia. He was a prisoner. He was taken prisoner with the Taliban. He was basically an Al-Qaeda guy. Um, 19 years old. His name was Fouad Nasir, and he was from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And I found him in a house. Uh, he'd been shot in the arm. He's holding onto his arm there. 
And you know, most of these Al Qaeda guys are pretty terrifying. I mean, they really are. Um, but a lot of them were just kind of like losers, you know? And Fouad Nasir, God bless him, uh, he was just kind of a loser, you know? And he'd, he'd been recruited, he'd gone to, and this was very typical. Um, he was at, at Hajj in Saudi Arabia, the, the big religious pilgrimage. He'd been recruited, somebody said to him, do you want to fight the Jews? Um, I can take you to Palestine. He didn't know, he took all his money and he, and he went. And suddenly he found himself in Afghanistan. He wanted to go home, they wouldn't take him. Um, and he finds himself on the ground, uh, prisoner. Um, I don't know what happened to Fod. I, I, I talked to him, he sort of told me his story in this house. The guards were standing over him, basically debating whether to kill him or not. Um, I remember he gave me, he said, could you try to tell my mother that you saw me? Um, and I said, sure, you know, give me your address. And he gave me an address, and as it happened, I, I was working for the New York Times, then I, I, I had a friend who was in Saudi Arabia at the time, a colleague, and I, I gave him the address. And he looked around for his parents and couldn't find him. Like, the address wasn't, wasn't quite good enough. But um, I can't imagine that he made it back to Saudi Arabia. But um, anyway, that's me. I think at this point I hadn't taken a shower in about three months. But... Um, you can see how beautiful the landscape is. This is the road between the road to Kandahar. Um, yeah, this is the last shot from Kabul. So just for a moment, um, I, want, I want to kind of uh, ask you to rewind your brains a little bit, and we're going to go to Iraq. Um, and you know, I, sh I should just say, before I start to talk a little bit about Iraq, um, I want to kind of take your questions afterwards, and I don't want to drone on forever. So. Um, you know, you know, save your questions, or I don't know, or shout them out. Um, um, but let me, um, this is Iraq, of course, you don't need to see a map of that. I just want to kind of give you a quick overview of kind of what I did. Um, again, really typical, the New York Times, <laughs> they, they called me about a week before the invasion and they said, look, um, we're embedding a bunch of guys with the military, but we want you to just go on your own. Um, <laughs> since." with James, and they, they called up James Hill, who was living in Moscow, and they said, you and James were so great in the Afghan war. So we were just thinking you could go and just kind of go in there and drive around a little bit. So <laughs> being the total moron that I was, I, I, flew, to, I, I flew to Kuwait, and um, of course, I, 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 you know, I checked into the Marriott Hotel, and I, and I, I went to the Hertz rental car, and, um, and, I, and I asked for an SUV. And, it's really funny. The guy said to me, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna take this across the border, are you?" And I said, "No, no. I'm just gonna take the family out for like a picnic, like near the border or something." And and <laughs> and then of course I just you know I drove across the border on when the invasion started. And um, before I go on too much, well, I, I, I want to tell you a story about the rental car because it's really funny. But um, um, so anyway, basically, you know, you guys probably all remember, but. So 165,000 American troops, um, bam, they just went straight to Baghdad. Uh, and that was kind of, the plan was go to Baghdad, take down the government, and go home, right? Um, little did we know. Um, but that was kind of the plan, and it was a weird time. Um, you know, well, I'm just gonna, I'll walk you through some of these. This is just kind of some shots from the initial days of the invasion. Most of these in the beginning here, these photos are taken by James Hill. Um, and it was just, you know, again, I'm just, James and I are driving in the Hertz rental car. We've got this Egyptian woman that we flew in from Cairo who's riding in the back seat. And we're just driving around. This, this is a nice shot. The, the important detail here is, uh, is the Skittles. It, this, was, um, this was like in the middle of a dust storm. I don't know if you remember, there was this huge dust storm in the beginning of the invasion. Um, this is, this is kind of interesting. Um, you see this a dead Iraqi soldier. We didn't see very many dead Iraqi soldiers. There, weren't, there wasn't very much fighting. And what, what we did see, and it's just remarkable, and it tells you a lot about the war, was as we drove to Baghdad, and that's a long line of trucks, and really, it was an extraordinary thing. That line of trucks went for 50 miles, you know? Um, just truck after truck after truck. And we'd see soldiers like this occasionally, but what we saw were Iraqi uniforms because they were just taking off their uniforms and throwing them on the ditch, you know? And so everywhere you could just see the piles of uniforms. They were just deserting that fast. Um, so um, that, that was un actually uncommon. 
You probably remember this. This is uh, this is the Saddam poster. This is an, uh, probably a good time to tell you about what about the rental car. But um, um, this is they're pulling down the statue. You know, we all thought the war was over. Um, so, you know, it took 19 days. I think it was 600 miles. Uh, you know, and um, well, I should I should tell you about. Trying to think whether to tell you about the yeah, I'll tell you about the rental car. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of ashamed. Um, so I, I, James and I drove north, and and we drove we drove to Baghdad, and uh, you know again we were kind of we hadn't taken a shower in three weeks, and uh, but the car was in great shape. We'd gone through all these kind of ambushes and these helicopters that shot at us at one point, and um, we almost got run over by a tank once, and, and but the but the car was in like perfect condition, and then we got to Baghdad, and things were crazy, you know, and, and everything was nuts. But the, I was very proud to say that the that the SUV was in perfect shape. And, and so I stayed in Baghdad that first trip, I think, for about six more weeks. I drove the thing everywhere. The city was, was in total chaos, uh, not, a, not a scratch on the car. And, and uh, so finally, at the end, I think it was in May 2003, I, I, it, it finally came time that I had to take the SUV back to, to Kuwait City. So I drove, you know, I drove, I backtracked. I went 600 miles the other way, you know, bribed the guards at the Kuwaiti border. Um, went in, uh, very proud of myself, drove into the parking lot, and I was, I was handing the keys to the guy at the Hertz rental car. Another car backed into my uh, SUV and <laughs> took, took off, like took off the mirror, you know? Um, anyway, so we're gonna go really fast. I just wanna, you, you probably remember what happened, but uh, this, is, this is sort of happier times. This is one of Saddam's, one of Saddam's palaces. There's just a couple of, this is literally in Saddam's palace in Tikrit. Uh, the day after the regime fell. Uh, and I, you know, we were just running around. Um, um, it's a nice little scene, isn't it? Um, this is, and I, I kind of want to stop here and talk a little bit. This is the central bank uh, in Baghdad. And it's, of course, I don't know if you remember, but, uh, you know, it was such an extraordinary day, April 9th, 2003, the day that Saddam fell. The whole, the whole war changed that day. Um, it, the night before, I, I had driven up uh, and I parked with, the, I was shadowing the Marines and 165,000 American troops had, microphone. sorry, sorry, 100, 165,000 troops uh, were literally on, on the outskirts of Baghdad. And they were, we were going in the next morning, April 9th. And nobody knew what was going to happen, you know? There were all these rumors and, you know, oh my God, there's going to be a fight to the death and there's going to be chemical weapons and all this stuff. And, and, you know, we drove into the city that morning, April 9th, and there was nothing, you know? Um, and you could tell the army had disintegrated completely, um, totally calm. By 10 a.m., uh, the looting began. Um, you know, by noon, uh, the city was on fire. By, by 3 p.m., uh, it was complete and total chaos. And I, and I remember that day so clearly because, you know, we went in in the morning uh, with the conquering army, you know, 19 days, 600 miles marching in. And then you could just feel the whole thing turn, uh, you know, just watching the whole thing just kind of disintegrate. And, um, and I remember thinking at the time, my God, every 20 minutes that this thing goes on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take another year to get this back in the bottle. And... Um, it took us eight years to get it back in the bottle, but it all happened that day. You know, we kind of, I mean, I could ramble on about that forever, but um, it was an extraordinary day. Um, again, I, I got some great photos and I, I, wanna, I don't wanna talk for too long, but this photo tells, me, tells you kind of so much of what happened in Iraq. Um, if you just look at it, this is a, you know, a 19-year-old from Nowhereville, Kentucky, you know, uh, with some Iraqi guy. And you know, and this is basically what happened. You know, we, we went in there, we weren't really prepared, nobody spoke Arabic, nobody really knew, knew very much about Iraq, but most important, there was no plan, you know. Um, we figured we were going home. Um, you know, we're not gonna worry about governing Iraq or whatever, uh, rebuilding Iraq or whatever, we're just gonna take down the government, get out, it's their problem. And then the whole place just disintegrated. And so the American soldiers, you can't blame them. They just started grabbing people um, because they came under attack, and, but they didn't really know. And so look at, look at this. Um, 
Um, you know, he doesn't know. You can tell by the look on his face. You can tell by the look on his face. Um, you know, if he's not, if he wasn't guilty when they grabbed him, um, you know, he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna be feeling very good about America at the end of the day. Um, and that's kind of what happened. Um, the Americans in the, in the early years, as they came under attack, they would go into the villages and they would just grab the men. You know, they'd grab them. Um, there's another, there's a great photo here. That's a nice photo, I'll come back to that. But um, they would just grab the military, you know, they just grab the men. Uh, you know, somebody attacked us from this village, it was an IED strike, there's people dead, they just grab them all. And we just started making enemies, you know? There was an insurgency, of course, um, but it basically it, it metastasized because we kind of fought the war in an entirely wrong and I hate to say stupid, but, but any American general would tell you the same thing. Um, I mean, the Americans basically were able to stabilize Iraq because they, they changed their tactics and their strategy entirely over the course of the time there. But in those first, in those first months in the war, you know, things just kind of got out of control. I just want to, I do want to back up and show you that. It's such a great photo. I don't know if you can see the kid, you know, with the little, waving the little white flag there. Um, but uh, occupation is an ugly thing. And, and um, you know, a lot of Iraqis were very happy when we came. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of photos of that. But um, it gets old really fast. You know, the, the welcome wears out. And we saw that in Iraq. And we're starting to see it in Afghanistan, even after, after it's taken a long time. Um, these are just a couple of shots. I mean, you know, there were so many kind of absurd moments in the, in the occupation. This is Paul Bremer who kind of ran the thing. He always had a perfect suit on. I just wanted to put that in there. Um, he did his best. Um, I like that. Uh, you know, get the hell away, out, get, get, get the hell out of here. You can just see what he's saying. I, I'll stop here really, really briefly. Uh, um, one of the things that you forget, uh, it's easy to forget because the Iraq war was such a disaster in so many ways was um, in taking down Saddam Hussein, we really got rid of a terribly evil human being. And, and anywhere you drive in Kurdistan, which is the northern part of Iraq, they're not Arab, um, they're, you know, their language is different, their ethnicity is different. Anywhere you go, you see a graveyard like this. And Saddam, uh, in the 1980s and 90s, killed 150,000 Kurds. And you know, they call it the War of Annihilation. Um, and so they were very, very happy when we came, and, and rightly so. And, um, uh, but, it, but it's, again, it's kind of, it's, it's easy to, to forget in all of that, uh, that for everything that went wrong with the invasion, some things went right. Um, so this is, um, I mean, God, this is, uh, these are lists of dead that I just want to show you. This is Kanal Makia, who lives in Cambridge. He's a professor, um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, he tried and has been trying over the course of the years to kind of catalog and document uh, basically the crimes of Saddam's regime. And so he was literally compiling these enormous lists of, of the dead. And people would come and you know, look for the names of their brother. Where is he buried? What happened to him? When was he killed? Just an amazing, amazing thing. Um, these are just a couple of happy shots. Uh, there, you know, real life goes on in these countries. Um, believe it or not, that was like downtown Baghdad, you know? Um, you know, who would have thought, you know? Um, you know, like somebody probably shot him, but I wasn't there for it. But um, um, anyway, we tried. This is, I'm, I'm gonna try to speed this up a little bit. I'm going, I'm having too great a time. I could just talk forever. Um, this is, uh, uh, election day in Iraq. And, and I should just talk about that briefly. Um, I, you know, this was uh, 2005, April 30th, I think, the first election. And I remember we didn't know what was going to happen that day. You know, the country was imploding. There was chaos everywhere. And uh, I remember, you know, New York was calling saying, what's going to happen tomorrow? And we'd say, you know, hell if we know. Um, probably no one will vote. You know, it's too dangerous. Um, yeah, the, you know, the Iraqis don't know what democracy is, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, extraordinary. I mean, thousands of people by, by 7 a.m. were kind of filling the streets, and um, they knew perfectly well what to do. Um, again, this is another kind of ridiculous. I had to put in just a couple of silly shots just to kind of break the... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, this is... Um, 
Uh, you see, this is why I put it in the happy shots, because um, there's only so much we can take of this. But um, one of the problems that I, that I had and anybody had, and I mean, I as a journalist, but I'm sure you as a, as a reader or a viewer, you know, there were so many uh, suicide attacks and, and car bombings in Iraq. I mean, usually they'd all happen before 9 o'clock in the morning. And some days there'd be 30 of them. And, um, you know, the whole house would shake. I remember the house that we had rented at the New York Times. And, sorry, and um, I, think, I think by 2006, I remember there'd been about 1,000 suicide bombings. And, you know, you write, you write the two paragraphs and you say, uh, you know, a suicide bomber blew himself up today at a crowded market killing 25 people, right? And if you read that, you know, you just forget about it. Um, I would forget about it too, but if you've ever been to one of these, um, I can tell you, um, you would never forget. Um, they are absolutely extraordinary. And I, I want to, this is one in particular. Um, this was, uh, I remember the date very well, October 23rd, 2003. It's really the day that the insurgency took off um, in Iraq. It was the first day of Ramadan. And uh, the New York Times, you know, we'd rented this house in a neighborhood. At the time, I think we had 75 armed guards. We had machine guns on the roof. It was just nuts. It was a crazy time. But the International Committee of the Red Cross was just down the street. And um, at about 10, 8 o'clock in the morning, we were drinking our coffee. Uh, two suicide car bombs hit the Red Cross building. And so look at him, you know. Um, he doesn't know what planet he's landed on. And you can see... Uh, you know, that's one of the trucks right there. You can't, what you can't see is that right, right next door to the Red Cross was a girl's school, an Iraqi girl's school. And I will never forget, um, we all ran out the door at the New York Times to go see what had happened. The whole house shook. You know, my coffee spilled over. Um, I felt like I was living in a dollhouse, you know. And we ran out the door. And as we were running to the scene of this, the Iraqi school girls were running out, you know, and they had little blue uniforms on. And their eyes were open wide and their mouths were open and they were crying and they were screaming. And, and that's kind of, that's what one of these things is like. You know, he's trying to figure out if that's his friend, you know. Um, and if you can just imagine um, 10 of these a day, um, I don't know, in a, in a city the size of Washington, D.C., say, 10 of these a day, every day for five years. Um, not only what, what does it do uh, what, what does it do to, to a city physically, but what does it do to people's brains, you know? Um, and that's kind of what, that's what it was like there. And if really, if you ever saw one of these things, you'd never forget. Um, anyway, it's another couple of happy shots. Um, I, ne I need to turn this one upside down so you can see the look on his kid's face. But um, life does go on in these countries. It's a remarkable thing. I mean, this is like this photo was taken like in the middle of the war, you know, um, at, an, at an Iraqi amusement park. I don't even know where it was. Um, it's a nice shot. Um, this is actually a, this is the Euphrates River is just below there. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Americans built that. Um, so, again, I mean, I could drone on forever about this stuff. So, um, God, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm just going to pick up the pace here. Um, this is an outdoor mosque uh, in the middle of Baghdad. And I don't know if you can sort of look really closely. That's Muqtada al-Sadr. He was one of, the big, uh, one of the big leaders of the Shiites, which is the majority. And he was very, very anti-American. And I used, to go, I used to go stand kind of right. You could stand right here. Um, and where the prayer leader was, where the imam was. And these, man, this would go back for three miles, you know, um, open air, just, just extraordinary. Um, I used to go there just to remind myself of how, you know, how little I actually knew about anything. Um, I, these are a couple of, th th these are some scenes here from, uh, taken by my wonderful colleague, Ashley Gilbertson. We'd gone down to Karbala where there was, they were fighting against the Mahdi army. And there's just a couple of really dramatic, shots here that I want to that I want to show you um, some of these photos are just priceless um, including this one you can see this captures everything uh, I mean look at the electrical wires um, every Iraqi town looks like that you can see this guy um, you know he's carrying a machine gun that weighs about 75 pounds it's about 115 degrees out um, you can tell he'd rather he'd rather be somewhere else um, 
that's a dead guy. You can see the grenade that they shot out of his hand, but that's kind of the better. It's the same guy. Um, again, these are some shots from, from Karbala. I hate to, that's a sniper. You can see these are the spotters in the back and they're kind of, um, it's a nice shot. Um, that's actually Baghdad from this guy. Um, it's actually very, you know, it's the, it's sort of the one beautiful way to experience Baghdad. Uh, it's from the air. But um, um, I want to, um, this is Sadr City. Um, I think we're going to move into, um, I just, I just want to, again, I'll stop here really briefly. This is a colleague of mine. His name is Ian Fisher. He's a reporter there. And this just kind of tells you a lot. You know, you go try to interview somebody on the street, street in Baghdad. This was after a suicide bombing. They used to blame us for the suicide bombing. So we'd show up, and the crowds would be out, and they'd just be wild, you know. Um, and, you know, you show up looking like, you know, looking like me, uh, or looking like him, and it was incredibly dangerous. He has a bulletproof vest on, which we didn't wear t too often. That's his translator, uh, Abdul Razak al Saidi, who worked for us. He's since gone to Harvard. Uh, he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This was in like 2003 or four. But there's a big crowd of people you can see. He's really happy that he's there. Um, and let's see what I, we got a couple. This is, this is another colleague of mine, Ed, Ed Wong. Um, uh, he's still alive. He lives in Beijing now. Uh, that's me. I look older in this photo, I think. Um, but these are a couple of um, Mahdi army guerrillas who were killed right after I left. Um, this was in the Battle of, of Najaf. Um, and I want to, uh, this is the last kind of set of photos, and then I really, I am going to stop talking. Um, the, the, in 2004, as uh, Susan mentioned, I, I uh, accompanied a group of, could you go to the Iraq uh, map, please? Um, I accompanied a, a company of Marines uh, into Fallujah, uh, and it was like the biggest battle the war pretty much um, a company a company's about 150 guys and uh, Fallujah was kind of uh, it's not on this map but it's it's about 35 miles west of Baghdad and in 2004 it, it fell into the hands basically of the insurgency but the very kind of radical friends of the insurgency like Al Qaeda and others and it became basically a car bomb factory and so uh, they were just as soon as Fallujah fell to the to the insurgents the number of car bombs and suicide bombings in, in Baghdad just skyrocketed. So uh, November 4th, I think, 2004, 6,000 Marines went into Fallujah to basically take it back from, from them. Um, sorry, uh, this is street in Fallujah. We went in on foot. Um, it was uh, absolutely extraordinary. Our, our, the mission of the Marines that I was traveling with was to basically walk from down one street from one end of the city to the other, which was about five miles away. And uh, it was street to street, house to house. Um, so the 150 guys that I was fighting with, um, that, I was, that, I was, that I was accompanying, at the end of eight days, um, a quarter of them were dead or wounded. Um, that's how intense it was. So I just have, I have some pictures. Um, I just have some pictures from, the, from that time. Um, and it was one of those things, uh, I'll explain this photo, but, um, you know, I remember they, we embedded with the Marines, we knew Fallujah was happening, and they said to me, and, and Ashley Gilbertson, who I was with, they said, you know, uh, we're just going to put you in this kind of company that's over on the side somewhere, you know, um, nothing, nothing much is going to happen, and we were kind of angry about it. And then, you know, as the shooting started, uh, they got a radio message saying, oh, it turns out your company is like right in the middle. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of what happened. So we didn't even plan it this way. We got ambushed by these two guys, uh, and the Marines kind of took care of them. You can see it wasn't pretty for them. Um, they are not Iraqi. Uh, you can tell that pretty easily. They're from somewhere else. Um, this is actually me. I'm writing a story. Um, you can see the extraordinary concentration that I had because there's a guy going to the bathroom in the bucket, <laughs> and I wasn't even looking up. <laughs> so, so. I sometimes try to remember this photo when I'm sitting in my very plush office uh, at Times Square, um, that it wasn't always so nice. Um, anyway, th this is the last, last set of photos. Ashley um, stopped at one point. There was a calm moment in the battle. And uh, he just photographed some of these guys. 
And you know, the first thing you notice is how young they are, you know? Um, man, they are just kids, the soldiers who are fighting over there. They are babies. And the weird thing is, you know, and I, I often, and I, I'll, I'll probably end on this, this is uh, DeMarcus Brown. He was killed about two days after this photo was taken. Um, you know, I get frustrated sometimes, as does anybody who spent time over there, that nobody in America really, you know, with a, there's plenty of exceptions, of course, but people don't talk about the war. They don't really care, you know, it's like whatever. Um, and I think the reason for that is right here, you know. Um, it's because these guys who are fighting it, you know, they're not from Santa Barbara for the most part. Um, they're not from West L.A. They're not from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they're not from Manhattan. You know, they're from like Starkville, Mississippi, you know, and Oswatomi, Kansas, and you know, Nowhereville, North North Dakota. You know, and 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 that's why nobody hears about them. You know, and so I mean, he was from I don't know Martinsville, Virginia. You know, who can find that on a map? So it's kind of it's it's the war. These wars are strangely anonymous. You know, there's no draft. We don't have to pay for the wars. We don't have to fight them. Um, and so they, in, a, in a very weird way, they kind of, they, they, for 12 years we've been at war, but it's all kind of unfolded off the screen. So um, pretty much done here. Um, got a couple more to go here. And then I really do, this is uh, Nathan Anderson. He was, just, he was killed a couple days after this photo. These, this is all from Fallujah. Um, just about done here. But again, you can just see how, I think he was 19 when that photo was taken. Um, this is the last photo. Um, just to leave you with this, um, you know, this was a memorial service for uh, Bravo Company, the 1-8 Marines, which is the guys I was with. They were having a memorial service in Camp Lejeune, which is the big Marine base in North Carolina. And the Marines invited Ashley and me to come and, and you know, <laughs> We went, to camp, we went to Camp Lejeune, and I don't know, it, it was a memorial service for this, these guys who had suffered these extraordinarily high casualties. My God, 25% casualties in a week. Um, I don't know, I thought there was gonna be a parade, and a, a newspaper would be there, and the TV, and uh, big crowds, and there was no one. You know, we went to the gymnasium. Um, that's the company right there, one of the girlfriends came. Um, they didn't even have to pull out all the seats, you know? Uh, for the basketball game, um, and the you know the gravestones were kind of arranged on the floor. But but again, this stuff this is this is heavy stuff. You know um, these guys were maimed, they were killed, their families are wrecked, um, and nobody really much knows about it. You know um, we kind of talk about it in the abstract. So anyway, that's what I've tried to do tonight is to kind of get away from the abstract and just give you a little bit of the details. But now I'm gonna shut up and I want you, I'd, I'd really like to take some of your questions, if I could. Um, Let me just say, if you want questions, you can come down here and line up at the two microphones and then ask Dexter the questions directly. And don't be afraid. <laughs> Thank you.